Okay, it's five o'clock with five minutes in Guatemala City and Central Standard Time. My name is Sergio Martinez. I am the clinical director here at Universidad Francisco Marroquín. Uh, I am, um, I've been requested to give some initial words in this student-driven meeting that we hope is the first of many so from behalf of uh, Universidad Francisco Marroquín and the Center for Global Health in the University of Pennsylvania, I would like to welcome everybody to this meeting. Um, Some time uh, ago at the Center for Global Health, um, we were looking for some activities uh, for our two institutions to have more interaction this is a time where we all feel so far away from each other and uh, we need uh, some activities, something uh, that can make us feel uh, nearby, closer. I'm pretty sure we all have the same problems or similar problems. Uh, we want to see our friends, we want to have classes together and uh, some of us uh, haven't been able to do so. And from this, very long relationship uh, with uh, UPenn. Uh, UPenn is the oldest um, institution that our School of Medicine has relation with. And um, as I said, this is a student-driven uh, activity and they are the ones organizing, setting this up. And uh, I congratulate all the presenters today that took the challenge of being presenting internationally to a group of audience that will definitely enjoy everything you have to say. We are encouraging the audience to participate, to make questions, to, if, if, if there is a question raising in the air, please um, use uh, your chat, use your microphones, and um, I will speak no more. So we can start this and the mics are yours. Once again, welcome, good evening or good night, wherever you are. So who is starting uh, this? Uh, the mics are yours. We have 43 people already in. Thank you so much. We will just share our slides. Excellent. Okay, so we are gonna start with the first case. Good evening, Penn and UFM students. We are gonna start with a case taken from the Iggs Hospital in Guatemala City in February, 2018. Uh, just so you know, I took care of this patient a, a couple of days in the observation room of the hospital before he was transferred to the corresponding uh, wing of the hospital. Feel free to participate throughout the presentation using the meetings chat. So we have a 29 year old male patient whose initials are OFAP that attended to the ER with a chief complaint of nose bleeding that started six hours ago. After interrogating the patient a little bit more in the history of present illness, he referred that six days ago, he experienced a single spontaneous and abundant nose bleeding that stopped after placing two nasal plugs. However, the bleeding recurred spontaneously 24 hours later. The second episode required medical attention by an ENT physician who cauterized mucosal blood vessels and discharged the patient home. Six hours prior to admission, a third nose bleeding episode occurred requiring attention in an ER. At this point of the clinical history, folks, is there anything else you would have asked the patient? Is there anything else you wanna know? Please don't be shy. There is a chat here and mics at your disposal. Yes. 
Okay, so let's see who is in the in the Okay, uh, diet, well, he had um, the normal diet, nothing relevant to the diet. Uh, this was the first time he had three bleeding episodes uh, in less than seven days. We are gonna discuss the blood pressure on the vital section of the physical exam later on in the case. Okay, so let's continue with his past medical history. He had bilateral hydronephrosis diagnosed in other hospital in June 2017 that required bilateral double J stents. One month later, in July 2017, he was diagnosed in that same hospital with CKD stage four. He is taking right now recombinant EPO 2000, 2000. international drugs subcutaneously every 72 hours, iron in the amino chelated salt form and folic acid. In his family history, there's no relevant info. In the social history, he's a student, he's Catholic and his civil status, he is married. He lives with his wife and one dog in his own house, which counts with basic services such as bathroom, electricity and water. Under health-related behaviors, we have that he is sexually active with his wife, three past sexual partners. He denied drinking, smoking, or drugs. He denies tattoos or transfusions as risk factors of having HIV. Dr. Martinez is wondering if he has taken any natural anticoagulants like ginger or green tea. And Jay is wondering if the patient is on dialysis. No, he didn't refer. He didn't refer uh, taking any of those natural components or substances. He is not on dialysis yet. Okay. Great, thank you all for participating. Some other questions uh, in the review of systems we might wanna consider. Um, was there any trauma? Um, was there uh, any nausea, vomiting or jaundice in terms of liver disease that might be causing um, bleeding disorders? Um, any constitutional symptoms like fever, weight loss or dyspnea? Um, if, if we're thinking of a potential coincidental anemia at the same time um, as well. Um, were there, um, uh, Lionel, any signs of trauma or um, any of the other constitutional symptoms I mentioned? No, he only had a couple of days, a low grade fever at night, but nothing else. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, I also wanna mention, um, so here, uh, we don't have too much information, but we do have bleeding or epistaxis as our chief complaint. Um, and one approach to epistaxis or bleeding in general um, is considering the location, which, which we know here is from the nose, um, seeing if there's bruising anywhere else, um, and then considering why we have this bleeding. So there can be two causes. One is from a blood issue, and the other is a vessel problem. So for the blood problem, there's probably something wrong with the clotting cascade and ability to clot. And that can be primary hemostasis with platelets, um, the number of platelets or the function of platelets in the setting of uremia, for example. For secondary hemostasis, there could be an issue with the clotting factors themselves. Um, and you'd wanna check PT, PTT for that. Um, in terms of vessel problem, in this case, um, doesn't seem to be um, any trauma, but based on the info we have, we can't really tell um, whether it's a blood or a vessel problem um, at this point. And I think we have some other questions. Where does he reside um, and where is the environment he lives? He lives in Guatemala City. Okay, I think um, now we can probably go ahead to the uh, vitals and exam. Okay. Uh, under the physical exam, we have a blood pressure in 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury, 98 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of 16, 37 degrees Celsius, which would be, I believe, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and a no to set of 98%. Under the physical exam, 
we have on the general appearance a worried young man with dry blood around his mouth and nose. Under head and ENT, we have a mild nosebleed controlled with a nasal plug made with a folded napkin. Cardiovascular, we only have a central tachycardia. Pulmonary, it's normal. Neuro, it's normal. And under abdomen, we have a soft abdomen without tenderness, guarding, or rebound. Normal bowel sounds. On the extremities and skin, we have a diaphoretic patient that had small petechiae all around his arms. Great. Um, I think just, uh, Clara, I think we're seeing your screen, but I think if you present uh, in this mode, we're not able to see the typing at the same time. I think if you could just share in this, if it's possible for you to share like this, that would be great. Huh? Perfect. And at this time, does anyone have any other physical exam questions for Lana or any other review of systems questions? No, um, you didn't really? have any GI bleeding. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, one finding that Lanell pointed out was the petechiae. So we can talk a little bit about those. Um, on the next slide, we have a picture of some petechiae, not from this patient, but we can see here that petechiae are generally small, flat, red spots of skin bleeding. They're usually two millimeters under diameter. If it's bigger than that, it would be considered purpura or ecchymoses. They are non-palpable, non-blanching, meaning that if you press on them, they won't disappear. There are many causes for, for petechiae, including severe thrombocytopenia, skin fragility, autoimmune disorders, malignancies, liver disease, bleeding disorders, and also many drugs, including glucocorticoids. And you can see in the second picture here that the patient, this other patient has petechiae on the inner lip. It's common to find petechiae there because there is less submucosal tissue protecting the vessels there. And when you notice petechiae, you wanna be sure to ask, a, a, go through a thorough review of systems to look for any systemic findings. Um, so like Monica had mentioned, we want to ask about any constitutional symptoms like weight loss, fevers, chills, night sweats, um, look for, uh, around for GI, ask the patient if they've noticed any change in their waist circumference that might indicate some splenomegaly. And then also ask if the patient has had any shortness of breath. Um, sometimes, uh, vasculitis such as, um, like oncosocial vasculitis can also cause pulmonary symptoms. So um, we wanna be sure to check for those systemic findings. You can also ask about uh, if the patient has had any arthrologies, um, photosensitivity, changes in the urine culture that could point you towards lupus because lupus can also cause uh, cutaneous vasculitis. Um, Leonel, were any of those review of systems positive for this patient? No, actually, we were looking for splenomegaly or lymphadenopathy. It, technically speaking, it's kind of difficult to, pal to palpate an enlarged spleen and grade the splenomegaly according to the Hackett's grading system. In Guatemala, we usually aid the diagnosis with a, an upper ab abdomen ultrasound or a CT scan using 20 centimeters of craniocaudal length as a threshold in a coronal view. But in this patient, it was impossible to palpate uh, an enlarged spleen. Regarding lymphadenopathy, the patient had enlarged, non-fixed and non-tender anterior cervical lymph nodes without any other symptom associated. Okay, so now- We, we had one more question about abdominal pain or, oh, I think you answered no abdominal pain or joint pain. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can go ahead for labs. Okay, perfect. Great job so, with the review systems questions, everyone. In the complete blood count, we have a white blood cell count in 8.4, a red blood cell count in 1.82, a hemoglobin in 5.4 grams, 16% of hematocrit, a mean carpuscular volume of 89 femnoliters, a mean corpuscular hemoglobin of 30 picograms, a red distribution width of 15.8, and 7,400 platelets. Under the blood chemistry, we had a calcium in 7.9, 
chloride in 105, potassium in 4.9, magnesium 1.95, sodium 136, phosphorus in 5.4, blood urea nitrogen 89, creatinine in 6.89, glucose 125, and uric acid 5.3. Under the coagulation panel, we had a PT in 11.9 seconds, INR in 1.08, and PTT 28 seconds. Great, okay. So based on the labs we have so far, just wanted to highlight what um, made the most impression on me. So the Y count is normal, but definitely when we look at the hemoglobin, 5.4, that's very low. Um, and with the MCV there, we see it's normocytic anemia. Um, and usually normocytic anemia, we think of systemic disorders um, and also anemia of chronic disease. So here the patient has CKD. Um, it's also interesting to note that he doesn't really have constitutional symptoms like fatigue or dyspnea here, which you would expect to see if it was an acute drop in hemoglobin, suggesting that this is probably a more chronic process going on. Um, as well, when we look at the platelets, which is very low at seven, uh, uh, we would actually think that it's probably a more chronic um, process there as well. Um, when we actually see both anemia and thrombocytopenia, one emergency that we'd want to consider is thrombocytic thrombo thrombotic uh, uh, purpura or TTP. And so uh, here uh, with, with TPP, we don't have all five of the pentad, which um, in addition to hemolytic anemia and um, thrombocytopenia, we would see neuro symptoms or renal insufficiency or fever. Um, although the patient has CKD, we, we don't have a baseline creatinine, so we don't actually know if there's an AKI here, but um, it, it's important to look at hemolysis labs if we're thinking about um, TTP. Um, additionally, uh, we wanna make sure to rule out DIC, which is also uh, another emergency um, when we have anemia and thrombocytopenia here. Uh, but to think about the, uh, the bigger picture, um, we have a bicytopenia with an abnormal uh, hemoglobin um, and also platelets. So an, the approach to bicytopenia is actually very similar to the approach to pancytopenia of, of all cell lines. So after the supportive care that the patient would get with resuscitation, um, we, the first step in management would actually be to figure out the underlying cause for this bicytopenia. Um, we would usually start with what cell line is the most striking abnormality, but in this case, both the hemoglobin and platelets are both very low. Uh, so I wanted to go to the, another, to the slide, actually, um, on approach to pancytopenia, um, and it, that essentially breaks down to um, three buckets of decreased production, um, as well as um, increased uh, consumption, um, and a, a combination of both. Uh, Clara, do you mind um, going to slide four for me? Thank you. Um, so the slide here just has examples listed um, for each of these categories. Um, and you can see um, from aplastic anemia to nutritional deficiencies can cause impaired production, um, as well as hemolytic um, uh, pancytopenia or splenic sequestration for peripheral destruction, and then combination of both can be due to drugs. Some of the drugs that can cause pancytopenia include NSAIDs, um, anti-gout uh, medications, antibiotics, as well as anti-epileptics, and there's a host of other drugs as well. Um, so definitely a, a big differential when we, when we start out. Um, so I actually wanted to um, also highlight that it can also be more than one cause actually causing the pancytopenia. So it's important to consider multiple factors at play. Um, so for the audience, actually right now, I wanted to open it up to more questions. I'm gonna also look at the chat to see um, if there's other labs that you guys want to hear from Lionel. Dr. Gomez was wondering about the lactate dehydrogenase and bilirubin levels, which I don't think we have for this patient. The great question. Yeah. Any other tests you would like to have done?
Okay. I think, it, oh, uh, someone's saying vitamin D, some of the nutritional labs. Yeah, oh, and a bone marrow biopsy. We don't have fibrinogen. Uh, we also don't have the vitamin D levels. We do have a bone marrow biopsy and we're gonna review it in a couple of slides. We also have peripheral blood smear, Marcella. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, you guys highlighted some important um, aspects of the workup. Clara, do you mind going to slide five for me? Uh, so here's actually um, uh, actually an approach to working up pancytopenia. So first you'd wanna rule out effects of drugs or toxins. In this patient's case, doesn't seem to have any effects from drugs. The initial workup would include a peripheral smear. That would help um, see if there's any schistocytes for hemolysis as well as um, any malignancies. Um, and then also inflammatory markers like ESR and then reticulocyte count. So one important thing uh, when you have anemia to, to, to consider is working up the reticulocyte index. And so that consists of the reticulocyte count and the hematocrit. Um, and so if the reticulocyte index is low, that means that it's not an appropriate response or an appropriate production in the setting of anemia. Um, and then additional workup would actually also would include um, the nutritional uh, markers that we had mentioned, vitamin D12, um, copper, zinc, um, as well as um, a bone marrow biopsy if we go down the production disorders pathway. So um, I think we can go ahead and actually, um, as, because you guys asked for the peripheral blood smear and bone marrow biopsy, if uh, Lionel can share those, we can go ahead with that. Okay, so can someone from UPenn and from UFM volunteer to describe their peripheral blood smear findings and the bone marrow biopsy? It's tricky, I know. <laughs> uh, Clara, do you mind pull it, putting this in full screen just for the slide? Thanks. Okay, I'm, I'm going to describe the most important findings. Here in the bone marrow biopsy, that is the small picture, we can clearly see a bone marrow with hyperplasia, predominantly with myeloid cell in different stages of maturation. Specifically speaking, we can see lots of band forms. If you remember, the bands are characterized by a nucleus with a horseshoe morphology, primary granules such as promyelocytes, myelocytes, and metamyelocytes, having the latter a kidney-shaped nucleus. So those are the findings of the bone marrow biopsy. Then we can see in the peripheral blood smear, uh, basophils, band forms too, we can see again metamyelocytes with the kidney-shaped nucleus and some mature neutrophils. So basically this patient was uh, said to have a chronic myeloid leukemia as a preliminary diagnosis. And later on he was, the blood samples were analyzed for immunophenotypification and karyotyping. Thanks, Lionel. And just a note about this blood smear. We see that a lot of granulocytes, as Lionel mentioned, lots of neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, but this can also be due to an acute infection. And so we have a couple of ways to distinguish CML from an acute infection on blood smear. One is that CML is highly associated with basophilia. So we see all of those deep purple cells with lots of dense purple granules, and those are the basophils. Also, um, CML, uh, we can look for a particular enzyme in the blood. Um, it's called leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. And in CML, that's going to be negative, whereas in an infection, that's going to be elevated. And then finally, um, we can do cytogenetic testing to look for signs of the chromosomal translocation that results in CML. So uh, on the next slide, we'll just talk a little bit about um, CML in general. So chronic myeloid leukemia, it's a myeloproliferative disorder, which means that we have an accumulation of mature myeloid cells. 
there are six types of myeloproliferative disorders. And in all of them, um, ever, all of these myeloid cell lines are increased, um, but we name the disorder based on which type of cell is the predominant cell. And in CML, that, those are the granulocytes, and particularly the basophils, because basophilia is highly associated. And CML is due to an acquired chromosomal translocation um, resulting in an abnormal chromosome 22 called the Philadelphia chromosome. This codes for the BCRA, BCR able fusion protein, which leads to activation of a particular tyrosine kinase, which then accelerates cell division and leads to this myeloproliferation. On labs, 96% of the time, we're going to see an elevated white blood cell count. And also uh, we'll see mild anemia, thrombocytopenia, basophilia, eosinophilia. And the diagnosis can initially be made based on the blood smear and bone marrow. And then as Linnell mentioned, we can confirm it with genetic testing, uh, either with FISH or um, with RT-PCR, looking for signs of that um, BCRA, bcr able fusion protein. And on the next slide, um, we show the different phases of CML. So unlike most cancers, CML is divided into phases instead of stages. And the phases are defined in part based on the percentage of blasts that we find in the bone marrow. 85% of patients present while they're in the chronic phase. This usually lasts about six years. And during this time, they might be asymptomatic or they can have constitutional symptoms um, like weight loss. Um, they can also have uh, splenomegaly and bleeding episodes due to platelet dysfunction. And then at this point, we would want to treat with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The first line is imatinib. Without treatment, CML progresses from the chronic phase to an accelerated phase and then to a terminal blast crisis. Um, the accelerated phase, um, and during this phase, we see neutrophil proliferation is increasingly impaired, increase in the blast, like you see in that table, um, low platelet counts, anemia gets worse and the spleen starts rapidly enlarging. And then in the blast crisis, we have over 20% blast. And at this point, the CML is now an acute leukemia. It can be either AML or ALL, depending on whether it's the myeloid or the lymphoid blast that are proliferating. So we have a question for the group here. Um, what phase do you think this patient was in at the time of presentation? And would also like to ask Leonel what phase do you think he was in afterwards? And also, what do you think about his labs? Um, do you have any thoughts on why he didn't present with the classic leukocytosis? So if anyone has any hypotheses here, feel free to share. So Susanna thinks he might have been in the accelerated phase. Hadia says perhaps the blast crisis, a time of presentation. Ana Maria agrees. So basically, this is like an, the interesting fact of this case, because usually, as you said, Rahel, 85% of the CML patients are diagnosed during the chronic phase of the disease that is characterized by thrombocytosis or a normal platelet count, usually with an elevated white blood cell count. However, I believe this patient was part of the 10%, four or 5%, depending on, on, the, on where do you read it, um, that didn't experience a leukemoid reaction at the time of the presentation. He had like 6,000 uh, white blood cells in the initial uh, complete blood count. So basically, that's like a to take home point, not all the leukemias present with leukemoid reactions as we are going to discuss on the next slide. Leonel, okay. do you mind also uh, letting us know what the outcome for the patient was? Um, did he receive chemotherapy? Yeah, so this patient was sent to the him onc wing, wing, sorry, of the hospital, and he started. I, I, I don't know what was the regime of chemotherapy that he was on, but it, this is this was a very tragic case in which the the patient passed away due to a, a anaphylactic shock secondary to the chemotherapy. He died. Um, before dying, he experienced a sepsis due to an E. coli. 
um, the blood cultures uh, revealed in E. coli that was multi-resistant. So basically, that was what happened with the patient. Thanks for sharing um, the whole case and also the outcome with us. Um, even though there's an unfortunate ending, I think we all learn a lot from the case. Um, and um, as we all mentioned, some of the takeaway points for the case are um, cytopenia is not a disease in itself, but a sign of underlying disease process. Uh, we learn about the three types of etiologies. Um, in addition, um, hematolytic findings for CML depend on the phase of the disease. Um, we uh, definitely learn a lot from the blood smear and the bone marrow biopsy and can confirm later with cytogenetics. Um, CML is associated with the phase of philia um, and the reticulocyte is key for evaluating a proper bone marrow response. Um, last thing just to mention, um, uh, like in this case, um, those who are receiving chemotherapy at high infection risk, um, blood cancers and in particular um, are also higher risk for tumor lysis syndrome. In this case, the phosphate um, was normal. Um, so don't think that um, this patient experienced tumor lysis syndrome, but something to also look out for. Um, with that, we, we have maybe one or two minutes for questions. Um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, um, we'd be happy to try to answer. Hi. I have, uh, I just have a comment. Um, some major points to take into account uh, before initiate uh, chemotherapy in this kind of patients, especially with CML, AML, and uh, uh, Middle East plastic syndromes are uh, probably, uh, you need to ask, as um, infectology point of view, you need to ask some the IgG and IgM from her herpes virus, uh, specifically because this type of person or patients probably can reactivate some herpes virus infections. Uh, this is one. The other one is you need to ask about um, uh, um, uh, hepatitis B uh, process. Uh, probably if you have only a core uh, uh, GM or a core antibody positive, probably you need to, to give some uh, prophylaxis with tenofovir. Uh, and the other thing is in this kind of process, uh, it's necessary to give uh, primary prophylaxis uh, for um, uh, fungal infections, probably prosaconazole or isibunaconazole. Some, uh, some of these are drugs that we can use for. Um, and the other thing is if you want to start um, more than five grams of, grams of uh, prednisone in this kind of patient, probably you need to give uh, primary prophylaxis also um, for um, the um, pneumocystis gervaici. Okay, that's all. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, there's definitely a lot that goes into managing um, patients right before um, we start them on immunosuppression. Um, so thank you. Um, yeah, I think it definitely, it would have been, in, someone commented, it would have been interesting to discuss resistance and mutations implication in the treatment scheme. Um, we focus mostly on diagnosis here, um, but um, definitely something to consider in the future. Uh, so with that, uh, not to take away too much time from our next presentation, we'll go ahead and, and pass it on to Clara and Ibrahim. Thank you all so much for participating. And thank you, big thanks to Leonel for tracking down all of this data for us and preparing this case. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So before we begin, uh, as Clara prepares the presentation, I would like to introduce Dr. Galdames, my advisor for this presentation. Um, Dr. Galdames, just a little biography for a uh, got his MD and MSc in internal medicine at Universidad Fra eh, in, in San Carlos, sorry. He has a master in infectious disease at Universidad Miguel Hernández de Elche, Alicante, Spain. He's a PhD, a PhD student at Universidad Miguel Hernández in Spain. He's the head of the infectious disease unit in the General Hospital X. He's also an associate professor, professor in the clinical department of internal medicine at our university. Is a reviewer of the European Journal of Medical Research and International Journal of STDs and AIDS. Just a little introduction. He'll be helping us throughout the presentation too. Uh, 
I'm glad to you. Ibrahim, do you want me to share or do you want to share? Can you go ahead and share? Sorry. Okay. Is it sharing? Yes, just get them in the, the full screen. Okay. You don't see the sidebar, right? So this case was also from a patient, I, a patient of mine from the same hospital, just in a different ward. So Mrs. X was a 26 year old female that presenting because of bilateral wrist, knee and ankle pain of five day duration. She pre initially presented to the ED with a sudden onset polyarthralgia that began five days ago. She described the pain, the pain as nagging that did not radiate or follow any specific pattern. Initially, it had an intensity of three out of 10 and three days prior to admission, it was alleviated with one gram of acetaminophen three times a day. She described that it worsened when washing dishes and mopping and at that time, the pain had worsened and increased in intensity, eight out of 10, to the point that she no longer was able to complete household chores. Additionally to that, she described multiple episodes of intermittent fever that were accompanied by eye pressure, headache, periodic rash on arms and chest, fatigue, sore throat, and loss of appetite. She denied traveling outside or within Guatemala, has never had any previous episodes or other sick family members. For the past medical history, the only relevant one we have is a history of hypothyroidism diagnosed in 2017 and currently being treated with levothyroxine, uh, 50 micrograms daily. No surgical or, tra or trauma history. Obstetrical and gynecological, the only relevant here is that she didn't have any pregnancies and was on oral contraceptive pills. Allergies in, we go to the next slide, yes. She was allergic to penicillin. She describes that it produces urticaria. No family history. And for the social history, she was a married housewife specifically that, that lives specifically in Esquintla. For UPenn students, Esquintla is a coastal city, a coastal state in the southern part of the country. Catholic, uh, high school degree. And relevant for the sexual history, she was never tested for any STI, has had two sexual partners in the past on one current partner and denies any animal exposure. No, as I said, no family history. And for the review of systems, the only symptom that she actually described was uh, from all the ones that were asked, the only one that she uh, described was heartburn. So, I would like, or we would like one student from each university to give us their insights, maybe some differential diagnosis thus far. What do you guys think? Please let's have volunteers. We have some people saying Chikuyunga, Dengue. Okay. So, Susanna, can you speak up and maybe tell us why? Um, the fever, the, the fact that she's from Mesquintla, it's a place where that's very frequent. The joint pain also, the, the rash mm -hmm. uh, can also be presented in these patients. I think those would be my, uh, the things I would think about. Okay. So we have Javier and Andrea saying dengue. Could you guys tell us why? I, I was also thinking about dengue because of the fever. She was presenting the pain and also because of the regional area she has, but maybe the 
ocular pain might not be that associated with dengue. So my diagnosis might be wrong. Yeah, I thought the same thing. So maybe we can get insight from a UPenn student perhaps. Different people from, that's not Rahel or Mark. Hey everyone. Yeah, so this is Sebastian from UPenn. Um, I guess another kind of bucket, uh, and we like to talk about things in buckets um, for this case would be rheumatologic. So, you know, we have joint pain and arthralgia um, with some sort of, you know, the fevers could just be because of the general inflammatory reaction that she's been having. Um, so a good skin exam, skin and joint exam would be appropriate in this patient. Thank you very much. That's great. We'll give you a little bit more of information and then I would like the same people to come in again and see if your differentials changed throughout the presentation. So Clara and I came up with a few differentials too regarding this, mainly infectious and certain autoimmune diseases, but mainly the viral ones as some of of the students that they engage in Uya, Zika. We thought about infectious monosyndrome specifically in their acute phase, right? Where we can have fever, rash, joint pain and all of those symptoms that usually go with a, an, an, a specific, an, an a specific viral, viral um, infection. Same thing for Hep B and C. In this case, thinking about the rash, maybe parvovirus B20, B19, even influenza. Bacterial, we thought about uh, rheumatic fever, typhoid fever. Clara was uh, thinking about rickettsia, leptospirosis, malaria as a parasite, and uh, of course, autoimmune, lupus, still disease, and even neoplastic, uh, such as leukemia lymphoma. Probably another um, bacterial infection to consider is uh, uh, meningococcemia that could be um, could give a rash, uh, uh, but it's different because or usually the rash in meningococcemia is you can uh, you can touch the rash, okay? It's, uh, you can touch the purple, and it's different from dengue, for example. I don't know if some someone has some consideration about uh, what kind of rash uh, or how to identify that the rash is part of a dengue virus infection, which is different from others or other kinds of rash. Some students don't want to participate. Hey, doctor, the See? dengue rash is characterized by a, like a more um, red rash with like white areas. Uh, spread around the same red rash or more macular rash. So it's kind of like reticular in the, like in the, in the way it, it, it appears to be because it has the white lesions. Uh, right in yeah, and uh, if you read some um, infectious diseases books, uh, you find, you will find that they are described that red, that white island uh, in, a, uh, in a red sea. Uh, because they are so round uh, white areas in that red rash that is uh, generalized. We'll go ahead and continue with the vital signs and the topometric measures. So a BP in 100 uh, over 60, heart rate 88, respiratory rate 16, OSAT 95%. The most remarkable vital sign here is a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, 104 Fahrenheit. And for anthropometric measures, for us at least, she is an overweight patient with a BMI uh, of 27.5. Go ahead. For the physical exam, the most uh, outstanding uh, findings were a young woman that was visibly in pain. She was breathing easily and speaking full sentences. Regarding Sebastian's concern with the a, a, a osteomuscul osteomuscular exam, there was tenderness at palpation, specifically at, at the knees and the ankles, and a macular papular rash, specifically on the forearms and an anterior, an anterior thorax, a negative tourniquet test. The 
This is the fever curve or temperature curve of day one of admission. So the first one, 40 degrees, right, was at admission. And this is how it behaved throughout the day. And we have the second one of the, the next day. And that's how it behaved. Can anyone comment on this? What do you guys think? Does this give you another clue? Uh, if I remember cor correctly, I think the is characterized for, by, for yeah, exactly, by physic fever, as, uh, as in the chat. Mm. That's great. Okay. Um, just to go back, um, I wanted to ask oops, one question. If anyone could speak, um, who knows, could speak to what the tourniquet test is. Does anyone know what a tourniquet test is and the, what does it look for? What do we do it? Uh, the, tourni the tourniquet test is a test you do to evaluate like a vascular um, manifestations due to dengue, which would be like associated to thrombocytopenia. So you can do it with a um, with a cuff a hat that exerts pressure um, in the arm and like. Um, like, I don't know, do some pressure around the arm and evaluate for petechia or other uh, vascular symptoms uh, secondary to the pressure exerted to the arm. Perfect, thank you. Any comments on the fever curves? Besides Sophia, Sophia, can you explain why? Biphasic fever. I saw that it was because of the peaks that mm -hmm. were between the hours. So I thought it was biphasic because of that. Any other comments on it? I just want to um, read out the tourniquet sum. Yeah. Can I? Sure. I don't have my microphone. Oh, yeah, here. OK. Yeah, the tourniquet test is just for uh, capillary fragility, right? And um, it's uh, obtained if you uh, take the blood pressure, but the uh, cuff is inflated the midway. Uh, between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure and maintain, and you have to maintain it for five minutes. And then you have to count the presence of the petechia. And this, if you have 10 or more, the tourniquet test is, uh, is positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments? Just for clarification in, in my learning, because, uh, you know, here I've never seen a, a yeah, just like Rahel, I, I've never seen a, tur a tourniquet test done before. Um, so capillary fragility, which is what you stated the, the test is like, you know, trying to show with like 10 or more petechiae. Uh, like, what does that point us to? Like, what should I be thinking if I ever see a positive tourniquet test? For consider a positive tourniquet test is 10, uh, uh, petechia per inch. I don't know if I understood your question. Entonces, si te lo digo en español rapidito, eh, de que si si me pasa ese el el tourniquet test positivo, ¿qué diagnóstico no debo estar pensando? O como qué 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 categoría de de, de enfermedad? That's a red flag for uh, dengue. It's not uh, you don't you, you won't have a vascular fragility in all dengue in all dengue uh, presentations. So it is just it gives you an idea about uh, uh, a red flag in dengue. Probably is in risk of hemorrhagic fever uh, uh, or is in risk of an organ failure uh, that could be produced by uh, um, a vascular fragility and uh, uh, fluid leakage. Excellent, that's super helpful. Yeah, thank you, Lopez. You're welcome. And, uh... 
Okay. So at this point, to the initial people that stated some differential diagnosis, does it change your differential diagnosis? Do you stay by heart with those? Or do you want to know more before stating a differential? Man, I'm going to say that I, I always want to know more, you know? Oh, oh, always looking forward to see what, what else you got on the next slide. Um, but definitely, I, I do think that a, that a biphasic fever curve um, does point, right, to certain infectious etiologies. It does also, what was it? There was, there's some weird ones that we think of with, like, these fever curves that pop up in the afternoon. I think Mediterranean fever or something. Um, is another disease process that also shows curve, like it's a similar temperature curve. Um, so that got a little, you know, at least piques my interest and I want to make sure that I think through that. Um, but yeah, those are my thoughts. Awesome. Okay, so we're going ahead, I'll go ahead and present some labs and then we'll discuss again. So this is what we were discussing. Okay, so we have a CBC. This is the admission CBC. As you can see, we have a, a total white blood cell count that's 1.3, very low. But if we look at the differentials, the percentages of the differentials, we have norm, within normal ranges. But looking at the total absolute values, you can see that we have a neutropenia and a lymphopenia. Regarding hemoglobin and red blood cells within normal ranges, and then if we look at platelets, they're normal. Coagulation tests within normal range, we, if we look at the ESR and the CRP elevated, the rest of the tests, the glucose, BUN, creatinine, TSH, AST, LAT, bilirubins, and LAD, LDH are within normal ranges. They also tested or well, did a urinalysis, which is unremarkable, and a pregnancy test. So at this point, with those findings, do we have is, is there anything that uh, makes you think of different diagnoses or something that actually confirms the initial one you, you stated at the beginning? Yeah, do you have another diagnosis in mind uh, considering mm -hmm. lymphopenia? What do you guys think of other diseases that might cause leukopenia, like isolated white blood cell disease, like leukopenia on its own? Someone say um, that they would look at ANA antibodies, which would be a screening tool for just general rheumatological. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good option to think uh, with uh, anti-nuclear antivirus, but probably um, uh, you will uh, find a react uh, uh, urine analysis, probably nitrites and some leukocytes in the urine analysis. HIV is a good option, especially in this case, it's not a chronic HIV, probably it's an acute uh, retroviral syndrome which is presented in the 40% of the patients that acquire HIV in the primary, primary infection. Uh, and it's only um, and it presents usually two weeks uh, to one month after the, the, the infection. Okay. So um, Sebastian and Marcela were asking for HIV. So next slide, we have all the infectious disease panel. So can we have maybe Marcela or Sebastian to interpret some of these findings? I am always happy to, to participate. Um, so for the HIV, you're looking at, I, this is the, are you looking at both the antigen and the antibody? Is that what the- Yes. A, G, and A, B both mean, okay, so that's mm -hmm. non-reactive. So we're not, you know, so we're at least, you know, not in the window where we would have a positive HIV test. We still can't rule that out, I think, if it was, you know, um, let's say a week ago or two weeks ago that she had exposure. Um, going to the 
the red area, um, VCA, gracias J, is just for EBV. And so we have IgG, so that means she has protection. I, and then uh, that Epstein Barr NA, what is that for the Ig? Is that just another? Sorry again. The EBNA Ig, the third one, that's also positive. What that, what does that translate to for me? Yeah, that's the Epstein Barr nuclear antigen. Okay, perfect. So previous exposure. So I think that's just still previous exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then CMV also, you know, the fact that the IgM is negative and IgG is positive shows me that it's not a recent infection. This is something that she just has immunity to. At least that's how I'm thinking. Marcella, I am welcome to hear other ways that you interpret these tests. I would interpret them very similar as you just did, Sebastian. Thank you. I don't have any additional <laughs> review. Just a question, if you are considering just in case, so for example, uh, an acute uh, infection, mononucleosis or an acute infection by Epstein-Barr, um, uh, what do you expect to find in, the, in these labs? I would expect uh, an IgM being positive. And something more that you, uh, you want to know? Probably is not here, but if you want to ask the, for it. She pedophile anti glutenin. Uh, man, what was that? Claire is smiling like she knows I'm close. And I know she knows I'm close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, probably you can ask about uh, heterophile um, uh, antibodies, which are usually positive. They are not specific, but they are so sensi uh, sensitive for uh, uh, acute diagnosis of Epstein-Barr infection. So it's uh, heterophile uh, antibodies and a virus capsid antigen IgM, and you have the diagnosis of um, Epstein-Barr acute infection. Um, in this case, uh, the Epstein-Barr nuclear antigen um, uh, is it represents obviously a past infection, and you start after the um, usually after the, the, the second month after the infection. Uh, and um, there's a relation between VCI IgM, and that's the problem with the VCI IgM and the cytomegalovirus IgM. In this case, this is not the case, but uh, this cool uh, present that have the clinic presentation that, like this patient. And probably you can find a VCA and IgM positive and a cytomegalovirus IgM positive, and they are uh, a cross reaction of, uh, due to um, uh, polyclonal stimulation. Just to take, if you want to take that uh, for home. Hmm. Was this patient tested for parvovirus B? She was not. She was not. That's well, a good I don't have that. those, the serology. At that point, she was not tested for that. Okay. Additional labs for this patient. A thick blood smear was ordered and was uh, reported as negative for parasites. We have a pending blood smear, a peripheral blood smear, a pending blood culture, and she was... Uh, Serology for vector-borne diseases was obtained, and these are the results. So at this point, what do you guys think? What's... So can I translate this as less likely acute dengue infection? I don't know how long IgG lasts in terms of like a, a dengue um, exposure. So this is good learning for me. Well, I would like to know the titles of the IgG in dengue in order to uh, know if it can be due to an acute infection, even if the IgM is negative. Okay. So unfortunately, in this case, we don't have the specific titer titer, sorry. And that's the way they reported it. So my question to everyone is, is it dengue or not?
Okay, Valesca says it could be possible. Marcela says no. Sebastian says no. Rahel says no, okay? We don't know yet. We just with the IgG positive, we could ask for a viral culture to um, evidence like the virus in tissue. Okay. So I see that a lot of people say no. Jose Stein says yes, probably. Okay. So at this point, the patient after a day started to develop abdominal pain, a slight decrease in platelets was evident. The next day, the patient started to elevate to show elevations in her hematocrit. She was admitted to the ICU, managed with IV fluids and strict vital sign monitoring and during output after two days, the patient clinically improved, her labs improved. She was transferred to the internal medicine ward. And after seeing that she was stable, she was discharged home. Does that change anything about this? With that additional information? I would still think of uh, dengue. So Su Susana says dengue. Right. Do we agree on that? Javier says hemorrhagic fever, maybe. Yes. So yes, at this point, the patient was managed as a dengue with warning signs. And later on, we're gonna see what the clinical implication of that IgG means in this case. Go ahead, Clara. Probably up. Uh, clue is the the patient was in the fifth day of uh, fever. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we said, this patient was managed clinically and determined to have dengue. Um, that being said, I just want to make it very clear: we, well, just respect all people's time. I know it's for uh, six, seven o'clock, um, or six o'clock for some people. Obviously, if you need to run, that's totally fine. We do have a. This next section will take about 10 minutes. So if you can hang out, that'd be great. Otherwise, totally understand. Um, so just for the people who are less familiar with dengue, I know that uh, it's not endemic for us in the United States. So I'll really quickly review it. Um, it's a flavivirus. That means it's a single sense RNA it, and there's four serotypes and that's important. I'll explain in a few minutes. Um, overall, it accounts for 300, 390 million infections worldwide per year and 21,000 deaths per year. Um, and it's most prevalent in areas that are warmer and near the equator, um, humid, because it's transmitted by two types of mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti and the Aedes albopictus, um, which are prevalent in these regions. Um, the way it's transmitted is by infection, by being bitten by an infected mosquito and the mosquitoes become infected by biting a human. Um, so as we said, the reason we end up you know, being thought as dengue is because of the fact that the way it progressed. Um, dengue has a four to 10 day incubation period um, once you've been bit. And then once you start having symptoms, you there are three phases in general. And those phases can be divided into the febrile, the critical and the recovery phase. Um, the febrile phase is marked um, by a really sp severe spike in um, uh, temperature up to like 40 degrees centigrade. Um, and this is the height of viremia in the individual. They also tend to become dehydrated. However, um, they can also show some like leukopenia at this point. Um, some people then go on into a critical phase, which is um, defined as, uh, this is when people start getting, uh, <clears throat> they start, they, they're, sorry, their vasculature becomes leaky and they start losing fluid into the interstitium. Um, you can go into shock or you can start actually bleeding because you become a thrombocytopenic. Um, and then most people will be treated symptomatically and uh, supportively and will recover and go into the recovery phase where they start reabsorbing the fluid that was in the interstitium um, and they start recovering. At this point, their platelets also recover. They're no longer thrombocytopenic. And it's at this point actually that the IgM and AGH in their uh, blood is the highest. Um, now, in terms of uh, classifying like how severe dengue is. The WHO has 
changed its opinion several times. Um, the most recent classification is the 2009 classification that divides it dengue into dengue with warning signs, dengue without warning signs, and severe dengue. Now thinking about our patient, um, given the fact that she was transferred to the ICU and she actually had this severe abdominal pain, um, and that this happened right after death, death for, when she stopped being febrile after five days, um, this would put her in the dengue with warning signs area. The fluid, the reason she has abdominal pain is because it, it, the abdomen is an area where you can get fluid accumulation. So this was evidence of the fact that she was losing fluid into interstitium, or at least it was interpreted as such. Um, so yeah, like we said, dengue, first beginning is high fever. Then when you start being feverish, you can go into the um, acute phase or this more severe dengue where you go into shock. If you don't go into shock, you just skip that phase and go straight into uh, recovery. She did not have severe dengue because she wasn't in shock. Um, she didn't have severe bleeding um, and she didn't have any evidence of organ failure. Um, like I said, the stereotypes of dengue are interesting. And the reason why is because dengue is uh, a unique virus in the fact that prior infection with a different serotype actually gives you an increased risk of severe disease. Um, and this was recently discovered, actually fairly recently discovered because um, there's dengue hemorrhagic fever as was previously considered where people would start bleeding out. Um, and the, your highest risk of this in shock and death if you were previously infected with a different serotype. And the reason why is because when you get infected with one serotype of um, dengue, you start producing antibodies and those give you homotypic immunity, immunity to that serotype. But they only give you transient heterotypic immunity, which means immunity to the other serotypes. And once this transient immunity passes of a, after like six months to a year, um, if you get reinfected with a different type, um, you actually have these things called non-neutralizing antibodies. And the way it works is when you have this non-neutralizing antibody, the virus actually uses that antibody as a way to get better access to your uh, macrophages and your other FC bearing cells like the dendritic cells. And this makes the infection worse. That being said, after your second infection, most people become pan-immune to all other, to the other two serotypes. Um, touching briefly on diagnostics, we mentioned that the tourniquet test here would be a positive tourniquet test. Um, but to, just of note, the reason her tourniquet was negative is, um, as the doctor mentioned, it's an indication of uh, fragility of the capillary. So it's more likely when you're gonna start bleeding out into severe dengue. Um, and it's only about 35% uh, sensitive for dengue itself. Um, the way we detect dengue, um, there are some ways that are very sensitive and specific and some that are less sensitive and specific. Um, the most sensitive and specific would be virus isolation in a culture. You can also detect the genome with uh, RT-PCR or and you can detect the antigen, which is called NS1 antigen. Um, you can also de detect basically evidence of the infection through looking at the antibodies IgG and IgM. Uh, in less resourced area, in the United States, if you look at the CDC guidelines, we just go strict to the RT-PCR, um, which is highly sensitive and specific. Um, in places with less, uh, more, less resources, you tend to have the IgG and IgM instead. For our patient, we had IgG, IgM, and the NS1, which the NS1 is actually negative, um, which begs the question of was this dengue or not? Um, and per the guidelines from the Pan American Health Organization, um, this case was actually highly suggestive of dengue. And the reason why is because we had an IgG that was positive, um, but we had no positive IgM and no positive NS1, and we didn't have a positive culture. Um, so for them, for this patient, what actually should have happened is if you look at here, you can see that she had a positive IgG, but a negative IgM, um, which would have put her as a probable case. And the way to confirm this case is actually to take another sample of blood in 14 to 21 days and check to see if she's seroconverted, if she's now having IgM, or if her IgG titer has increased significantly. Um, and if that's the case, that would be considered a uh, evidence of dengue, a uh, confirmed case. And the reason why is because if you look, um, the presence of these antibodies in the blood depends upon whether it's a primary infection or a secondary infection. In the primary infections, um, IgG, um, IgM peaks first, 
and then IgG comes later. So and you would actually expect in most people to have a positive IgM before you had a positive IgG. Um, in her case, she had a positive IgG first, um, a positive IgG. We don't know if she ever developed a positive IgM, which is actually indicative that it might have been a potentially a secondary infection because IgG stays high and positive uh, um, after your prior infection, while IgM only peaks a little bit and can remain negative during the secondary infection. That being said, because we never got the second blood exam, we would actually know if this was a confirmed case of dengue, although it was treated as such. And what's interesting about this case is um, Ibrahim was able to go back and check on her because this case was two years old. And it turns out a year later, she was found to have been persistently leukopenic. Um, and she was found to actually be positive for anti -DNA, double strand DNA, as well as um, anti ana anti-rho, and anti-law, which gave her a diagnosis of Strodrins and lupus, um, which this may have actually been a first presentation of that, but it's unclear because it also could have been dengue as well. Um, the other quick note is when you do these tests, it's always important for dengue to check out Zika as well because Zika and dengue antibodies can cross-react in the ELISA. And she was negative for Zika, so that it was not concerned in her case. And that's it. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Sorry, that was a rush. I apologize if I spoke too fast. And I have one, sorry. Um, when you were explaining why you would take the second test in 14 to 20 days, you said you would want to look for the appearance of IgM. Like, is it because you wanna see like the secondary infection showing? Because I'm a bit confused of why IgM would show 14 to 20 days later. Um, I think, um, and I think Ibrahim can speak to this more. It has to do more with I think, the sensitivity and specificity of the test. You wouldn't expect IgM to show, but you would expect the titer, the IgG titer to increase significantly over that period of time. Um, especially if it was a secondary infection because her IgG would have been at like a baseline level at the beginning and then it would spike towards the uh, after a few weeks of the infection. Um, the other thought is maybe the IgM was a false positive, false negative, I mean, and if she had produced a positive IgM later, I think that would have made us feel like it was a primary infection more so than a secondary infection, although potentially secondary. Another thing I want you to take into account is what we what Clara meant with testing later is to see the seroconversion meaning initially negative and then see if it what it went positive regarding the uh, the IgM. Can you go back to the algorithm? Yeah. So uh, so in this case, that's what what this guideline is trying to tell us. In within the first five days, we tried to look for those tests, but our our patient presented after five days. In this case, we can't really know if the, if, if, if the IgM actually started to elevate during that time or actually later. The problem is that the, the, what matters is the point or the, the point in time where you take that blood sample, which can make you have negative or positive. And then that's why they recommend an, a, a second one afterwards to see if there was an actual immune stimulation that can make you produce either the IgM or an increase in the IgGs, meaning probably a, a stronger immune response in the case of, as Clara said, a secondary infection, right? So that the titers would be higher or the other criteria is to have an increase in you know, a fourfold a fourfold increase, which make would make it a positive uh, a confirmed dengue case. I don't know if it's clear. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Yeah, Ibrahim, I completely agree with the answer. And other thing that to we need to take into account is that the antibody dependent enhancement. Uh, uh, in the secondary infection is due for the um, the uh, for the greater viral load uh, inside the monocytes because the this complex of our antibodies uh, pre-existing antibodies and the den new dengue or the new type dengue virus 
uh, joined or attached to the FC gamma receptor in the monocyte. And then uh, they have a, a greater replication and a greater uh, viral load, which uh, predisposed to uh, um, uh, probably a high risk uh, dengue. Dengue. And another thing uh, is that in the, hemato the hematocrite, we need to uh, probably something that we overlook uh, usually the hematocrite, but if you are you paying attention to the hematocrite, usually when it is uh, a, a, um, greater than 50%, uh, uh, this patient represents a high risk patient for the, all the fluid leakage. Oh, I don't know. Other consideration? Any other questions? In this case of a secondary infection, uh, there are some case series and case reports about using of immunoglobulins as treatment. Okay, um, we are now in the Instituto Guatemalteco de Seguridad Social, just um, um, trying to, to get uh, all the patients that we have had with a secondary infection, because we have uh, tried, uh, is specific in the hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic fever, and in, in those patients with uh, organ failure, we have uh, used immunoglobulin, uh, human immunoglobulin, and uh, they uh, have they have had good results. So they, we, we have only a case series from Brazil, but now we are preparing our proper uh, case series, which is really interesting. Thank you all. Any last questions? Otherwise, I think to be respectful of everyone's time, we will. Um say thank you. Um, and like Andy just mentioned in the chat, if you enjoyed this, please come support the rest of the presenters, um, all of your fellow students um, on the 21st of January. It'll be very exciting to see their case as well. Um, we apologize for any technical difficulties that made us run a little bit extra time today. Bueno, gracias a todos, de, a los de Guatemala, por venir y pasar este tiempo con nosotros. Y nos vemos el 21. Gracias. Okay. Nos vemos el 21. Gracias. El 21. Chao. Gracias. Prepara, Majo, está lista eh, el 21. Sí, seguro. Y muchas gracias, doctor Martínez y doctor. Muchas gracias. Oh, ok. Right. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.